All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and, re- and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, depending on your version. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, uh, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Let's pray as we hear God's word. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word. I pray that as we we hear it, we'll be blessed by it, that we'll might be conformed better to it. Uh, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all, my, of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. We ask it all in Jesus' dear name. Amen. I think it was um, interesting that, um, that we were as, um, as thinking about it this week. Of how, would I, how would I introduce this, this passage? I, I couldn't think of a better person. I'm something of an Anglophile, and so uh, I thought about Winston Churchill. I'm sure most of you have, have heard of that name before, once or twice. Uh, as most of you should, uh, most of you know, uh, Pre- Winston Churchill was the famed British Prime Minister who led the people, along with George the Third, in the uh, Second World War, especially in that war where they were leading the people uh, to victory over the Nazi regime in Germany, with American help, of course. Uh, he was a man of great fortitude of intellect. I mean, his speeches were, were really, really profound. I mean, it moved an entire nation to, to victory in that war. He was one of, of great intellect, of words and strength. He gave a, a riveting speech before the Parliament of the United Kingdom, or at least of the British Empire, to never give up. And it spurred the Parliament, and it spurred the nation on to victory, and you, you think of a man who's, who's done all of these things, and you think, okay, well, what would be his final words? What would be the last thing ever recorded by Winston Churchill that he would ever say? And he actually, it, it's recorded that he, he said this, I'm bored with it all. Uh, it's a little, you know, interesting that he would end it that way, but, I mean, you, if you think of a man who's, who's especially of a man who's, who's done as many great things as he's done and, 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 and said, many, made, made really great speeches, uh, that that would be his final thing. Of course, you should know that he was a bit, a bit exhausted at the end of his life. This was a man who was 90 years old. Uh, he was someone who had, had done a lot in terms of his own writing. He, had, he had, was suffering from the effects of his age from an earlier stroke that he had about some 10 years or so earlier. And so you would hope that his final words would be something riveting, but it was a little more solemn. Uh, you would expect maybe some more solemn words or riveting words, but maybe for him to say, I'm bored with it all, would probably, uh, were probably at least solemn for him at least. Um, uh, very similarly, uh, uh, Paul gives some final, final words as, as well, some parting, some parting things. And that, that was also part of the motivation for switching from Mark chapter 16 uh, or 15 to 16 to, to today. Uh, because I think that one of the things that we can, we can glean from this passage is, is something of the uh, solemnity and the conviction that Paul had and that he was trying to impart to Timothy uh, one last time, especially since Timothy was someone, as we saw, who had been well acquainted with the scriptures from his birth. Uh, we've not preached through First and Second Timothy, but I'll tell you that the, that the uh, faith that Timothy learned was from his own mother and grandmother, much like I would say I did. 
I'll always remember my mom reading us the Bible when we were kids through the, the big red Bible picture book that we had and how I would dress up as Bible man and, and just be ready to, to listen and to, and to read it. And I remember the faith that my, uh, that my grandmother also imparted to me as well. And that was the context of what Timothy, of where Timothy was at. But Paul is giving him some, giving him final words as one who, who was given an injunction, who was given confidence, who was given hope, who was given help. Uh, and what better word to Timothy from an older saint like Paul to give to him, a younger minister, as it were, than to just give him the simple charge of just continue to preach the word. Uh, it's probably from this scripture that he that he's that he knows it's about living a godly life for Timothy, for Paul, and for you as well. It's from the Word of God that, as it is from God, uh, it's the primary means of conversion and equipping saints for godly living. And what we see then in our teaching today is that we're to embrace an enduringly godly character in someone who in, understands the import of gospel preaching, and that's what I and that's. Mostly not so much focused on on you, though uh, it it, it's, it inv- involves you to embrace somebody ultimately who has an enduringly godly character and who understands the import of gospel preaching. That's the that's the main thing that Timothy or that Paul is leaving with Timothy, and it's the main thing that we leave here with you today. Uh, and in doing so, as we, we think about that enduringly godly character and someone who understands that importance of gospel preaching, we're going to focus a little bit on that preaching uh, and, and impart the man himself. Uh, there are two th- three things that we'll look at. Verses 1 to 2 teaches us about the solemnity of preaching. Uh, verses 3 to 4 teach us of the necessity of preaching. And then verse 5 teaches us of the character of of the preacher, the solemnity of the preach of preaching, the necessity of it, and also the character of it, and we'll look at that in those first five verses. Now, the first thing that we see there is in the solemnity of preaching in the opening two verses. I charge you in the presence of God of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom to preach the word. Uh, what we see here, there very clearly in verse one, is that this preaching has a strong charge. It is itself a charge in the presence of God, of God in heaven as his witnesses. Uh, anyone that, who stands in this pulpit or who stands in the lectern to teach, uh, or it, as well as any of us here today, ultimately is answerable to God Almighty in his presence as Christ is not just our Savior, but he's also the judge of the world. You, me, but especially, but especially the subject of whom Paul is directing these exhortations to, is young Timothy, and to you as well, that you and I are standing before the very presence of God. And for that reason alone, that charge is a very strong one. It's a very heavy one. Because the the, the reality is that it is in the very presence of God even now and of Christ Jesus. And how does he exhibit himself? How does Christ show himself forth? How does Christ make himself known to us today? If you were in Sunday school, you would know the answer to that is what? The word and spirit. We hear God's word declared in the scriptures. It's affected in our own hearts and minds by the help of the Holy Spirit. And Timothy's reminded of that, that all of this in his, in his life and his manner of living is ultimately to and for the glory of the Almighty God, especially as we look forward to his appearing and his kingdom. That word appearing there is, uh, is, uh, is the, the, the Greek word there for appearing is where we get our word epiphany from. Like, I just came to this new uh, revelation. I came to this new idea. It's as if it's just come almost on a sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing. And throughout the New Testament, we, we, we understand that the Scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is coming really rather quickly. Now, in the, now the history of the church is rather long. Uh, the, the church... The church technically began in creation with Adam and Eve, uh, but what most people think when we say that the church began will often attribute it to more, more technically, at least in the New Testament era, to the book of Acts when the church uh, began. The consistent hope then of the church throughout in the Old Testament was that the Messiah would come in the first place. 
and the hope of the church in the second in the second testament the new testament is that christ would come a second time as that victorious king but the witness in that is all that christ is indeed coming quickly he's coming soon hence the strong strong nature of this charge i charge you in the presence of god to pre and of jesus christ who is to judge to remind him that he's not just a savior but he is a judge in a courtroom and then by his appearing in his kingdom to then preach the word the charge of this is therefore that we are to re be re be keeping in mind that ultimately christ is coming and that he is coming soon that's the that's the, the strength of that charge the, on which paul is basing it is ultimately in the presence of god and that christ is coming again the solemnity of preaching not only has a strong charge, but it also has a number of essential qualities as well. And it begins there in verse 2 with that charge to preach, to proclaim, to herald the gospel of our salvation, which is in Jesus Christ, to proclaim his death and resurrection for sins, and that Christ will save you and keep you saved, and that he is indeed coming again. Or to preach the word. And especially for a minister, and this is not just true for a minister, but it's also true for believers. Paul directs Timothy there to be ready in season and out of season. It doesn't, it, for Timothy, it doesn't really matter so much whether he's in the pulpit or whether he's in teaching or, or whatever. It doesn't matter if he's ready or not, if he's prepared or not. Uh, what really matters ultimately is that whether he's behind the pulpit or in the street, he's to preach the word a similar injunction is given to not just to timothy but to all believers as well peter and i think it's first or second peter chapter three gives believers the injunction to always be ready to give a hope to really to give a defense or a reason for the hope that is in them for christ jesus sake friends the only reality the only way in which people can come to know the lord jesus is not through us saying nothing it's always about sharing our faith, living our faith. You can live your faith, certainly, but you need to declare it as well and to be ready to share it. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that there are people everywhere around us that the, we can say, I, I don't think this person's a Christian or I don't think that person is a Christian, but you're a Christian. You're in their life. And you're the only witness sometimes, perhaps, that that person has. And ask yourself the question, how am I actually representing Christ today? Am I ready out of season? Am I only ready when I'm in, in church? Am I only ready when I'm in the pulpit? Or am I ready whether I'm in the pulpit or whether I'm in the church building or not? Because the urgency of it this, this solemnity of preaching, or at least of sharing the faith, at least as far as it concerns Timothy, and for us as well, uh, by, by, uh, by, uh, by consequence, is that it includes a number of characteristics that he includes there in, in this chapter, at least in verse 3, where he says this, it encourages a readiness to be, re to be ready in season and out of season, but it also means to, to, to be ready to... Uh, reprove and to re rebuke one of the things that the scriptures are good for is to convince us of our of our error and to be and to be brought into greater knowledge of the truth it's good for rebuke because how else would we know of our sin unless the word of god was declared openly to us to 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 make it known to us that we are in sin uh, any preacher who's worth his salt will at least bring to light both in the pulpit and personally where we are backsliding, where we are falling short, and it's not to be mean. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't think. I, I don't imagine most pastors get their kicks off of being mean. Uh, if they do, they probably shouldn't be pastors. Declaring the truth sometimes is rather hurtful, and it does certainly come off that way, especially when you're on the receiving end of it. But that's his job. That is his job to declare the word of God. And even as it's difficult for us to hear the rebuke, it is our job as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ to receive it, knowing that it's because ultimately that he cares. 
He's also about exhorting. When we catch someone in wrongdoing, we don't just re simply rebuke them, but we exhort them to a to new life. One of the things that the Catechism has in uh, the Shorter Catechism, the Westminster Shorter Catechism has in its section on repentance unto life, is that it's that repentance includes us receiving and resting upon Christ alone, turning from our sins and looking and placing our faith in Christ, but endeavoring to new obedience. A pastor is going to encourage you to new obedience in his exhortations. At least he should. But above all, it requires in this second place here, uh, in this last bit, he says to do so with complete patience and teaching in verse 2. Uh, John Calvin says that this word for patience can be, be more readily uh, translated as gentleness, and he's probably right because both of the ideas are, are, are there. But I think what, what, what we need to keep in mind is that, you know, if you've ever tended animals before or you've, or you've, uh, you've you know, taken care of a child or, or, or anybody for that matter, family members, uh, sometimes things can get very frustrating and it can often be difficult to remain patient and to teach, in, and to teach the truth in love. It gets very challenging. And that's the high calling of, of any minister or any Christian as they represent the truth, to do so with patience and in love. You know, especially when you've told, the per told someone to do the right thing multiple times on end, 50, 60, 70 times, whatever it might be, uh, it gets really rather frustrating when you feel like you're beating your head against the wall trying to tell them the same thing repeatedly. But at the very least, what it means for us is that we are to do so still with patience and teaching. It's the consistent Christian character. And, I might add, it is a fruit of the Spirit of God. As well, I asked Roy a little while ago in Sunday school to recite for us what the what the fruits of the Spirit are, and he did so very ably. And one of the things that he included in there was patience and to endure it, and to deal not just not have a pastor that just deals with the flock of God, but even the flock dealing with their pastor and one another with the same patience and love as well. Now, the second thing though that we'll see here. Is not just the solemnity of preaching, but its necessity as well. And we see that in verse 3 and 4, where in verse 3, Paul tells us that the word is not always wanted. What does he say in verse 3? He gives us the reason, that he gives us charge, and now he's going to tell us the purpose for giving it, the reason. Because the time is coming when people will not endure sound, sound teaching or sound doctrine. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. He says the time is coming when people will not endure it. In other words, what he's saying is that they won't put up with it. They won't regard it. They won't enjoy it. They'll re in fact, they'll even reject it. In fact, uh, in the last days, the, uh, Paul talks about in Roman era, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, just a couple pages over, a couple verses over, uh, that that's exactly what what's coming in the God with the godlessness of the last days. It accompanies us, the, accompanied the church then. It accompanies us today. It accompanies us in the church. It accompanies us in our workplaces. It accompanies us in our in our uh, in our family lives. And what is that godlessness that accompanies the last days? I'll read you a few verses. 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, for people will be lovers of self. They will be lovers of money. They will be proud. They will be arrogant. They will be abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying his powers. Avoid such people. Now, he gives us that charge, and he's like, okay, well, then how do you then come back and tell us to preach the word? How do you tell us to be, how do you, ha you have to be around people like that to preach the word. Yes, it's true. Mind the company that you keep, yes, but understand that that is the world in which we live. That what he's saying here is that this is the world in which we live. And as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, called and sanctified and set apart, 
We're of the family and household of God and not that of the world around us to reflect them. And how sad and so often it is the case that even the church imbibes these characteristics. But it's because we're sinners. We're still in need of the grace of God, which is why he encourages Timothy to continue to preach the word because they will not always endure it. They'll wander off. People will wander off, both in the church and both inside the church and outside it. It's not easy to hear the truth, as I mentioned a little while ago, and nobody always wants to hear it. But but how many and, and, and you just think about it, like let's ask the question, how many of you enjoy being told you're a sinner? How many of you actually enjoy being told that you're a lawbreaker? How many of you actually enjoy hearing the 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 fact that you're both a sinner but you're also in are in need of Christ and his glory it almost becomes repetitious and yet it's the very real spiritual realities that you and I so desperately need but it's also so natural for us to flee from because it's not necessarily the most appealing thing in the world either Whatever else goes on in the world is very much more, more appealing and much, much nicer. In fact, the psalmist re- recounts for us off very often, doesn't he? That uh, why is it that the, that the nations rage? Why is it that they succeed and the righteous falter? It's the world we live in. But the charge for us is to endure sound doctrine. Not that n- understanding that many won't, but for us, the true reality is that we should. And the reason for that is and the reason for that is in this, in verse four, that there's always another fad that is nearby. The next fad is near. Because he says this many will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. A myth, no, the word myth can be accompanied for a lot of different things. Whenever you hear you and I hear that word myth, we think of something like um, you know, take a mythical story like the Chronicles of Narnia or Tolkien's, uh, uh, help, someone help me out here, Lord of the Rings, there we go. I lost my train of thought on the Lord of the Rings. But, uh, but one of those mythical stories which we, we, accomp- we, uh, we, we, we generally associate with something like a fairy tale, something that's not real. Well, in essence, I mean, that's what Paul's saying. People will wander off into things that aren't real but that they have some sort of bearing with the truth, which is what makes it so appealing. Uh, That ultimately, anything which has a kernel of truth that ultimately isn't true, Paul says is a myth because it's ultimately not real. It doesn't bring you into saving knowledge with Christ. It doesn't bring you into a better place. And how often it is the case that we are so given to it. We're attracted to the next newest and shiny thing. I mean, you just think about it. You know, I'll, sorry to go down this rabbit trail, but I'm going to go down it a little bit. Uh, I was, uh, came across a news article where someone, where someone said, you know, you're with, with this LGBT, with the LGBT movement of how they're, how they'll they'll let kids choose their gender sometimes. And it's like, you know, one, the person responded and he said, you know, I, I don't know why, why you would allow for that because sometimes my kid, my daughter is deciding what 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 uh what type of co- toy car they want to play to play with today? What color? What's their favorite color? What's their newest imaginary friend? It, the interests change from day to day, almost. I mean, in fact, I'll even give you an example. Someone I know has uh, ha- ha- his his son, his young son, maybe about four years old, has an imaginary friend that we <laughs> that it, that it's always really funny funny to see him talk about. Last time I saw him, you couldn't even you could you could have almost uh, thought or imagined that there was no such thing as an imaginary friend. He's like, oh, he's gone off somewhere else. He's not interested anymore. And that's true at young ages, and it's even true for us, even as we're older. We are attracted to the newest, the next, the brightest, the shiniest thing. Every last one of us. But Paul's injunction here. Is to, uh, is to teach Timothy that, yeah, you should understand that that is the case. That's the case not just with the world around you, but the church that you preach to as well. Which is why we need to remember 
a couple of lessons before I move to the final point. I need to remember two things. That as members and elders, even as you're looking for a new pastor, are to strive for a faithful ministry around God's word. To strive for a faithful ministry ultimately around God's word. We may look around at, our, at churches that seem to be growing and are blessed with success and it might sometimes become discouraged because you may think at times that, well, we just don't have uh, things that that uh, these people, we don't, we can't offer anything to these people who are coming in. You get discouraged when people don't come to church, sometimes even your own family. You wonder if it's something in us or if it's just simply something we don't offer and maybe that we can't. There are a variety of things maybe that we could do better and, and of course that's, that's absolutely true. But one of the things that this passage of scripture teaches us is that's all what people ultimately look for. And with, when they're in that mindset of looking at what we offer, simply at what we offer to satisfy their own inclinations and their own passions, that's why they wander to and fro from this myth to the next, from this truth to the next, from this church to that church, from this cult to that cult, or, or whatever it might be. Friends, the, the ultimate thing that you have to offer to anybody who comes or darkens these doors is not, strictly speaking, uh, the next greatest, biggest program or, or, or whatever it might be. Uh, churches, stand, churches stand and fall on those. Okay, they, they, they do. They stand and fall on programs. And if they stand and fall on programs instead of standing and falling on God's word, no wonder they fall. But you have to be motivated by God's word and letting it sink deeply into your own heart to, to, to orient your ministry around God's word. You have to be motivated and you have to be, have to be captivated by God's word in your own heart, soul, and mind today. And it doesn't matter uh, how young or how old you are, how many or how few you have. The ultimate thing that matters is that the spirit of God is present wherever his word is faithfully proclaimed. Okay, the, the word of God, the spirit of God is present in a church wherever the word of God is faithfully proclaimed. And that is the ultimate reality that should be at the very forefront of your heart and mind. Is finding someone who faithfully preaches the, the word of God. That is the inerrant, inspired, and infallible word of God to you and to me. You also should be faithful in your Christian walk regardless of what the future holds. So you press on, you, you preach on, you share on. Because you should know that by preaching the unadulterated gospel of Christ, you're offering the world not so much what they want necessarily, but it's what they need. We all know they need this because the reality is not only does the world need it, but you need it too. You need a savior. You need forgiveness from sin. You need to know of the perils of hell and separation from God. And you need to know that, that Christ offers forgiveness and eternal life. You need to know that too. Just as well as the people around you. You all need to know that and to remember that. Because in Christ, who no, where else do we have to go? I mean, what does Paul say, or what does, excuse me, not Paul, Peter say in John chapter 6? When everybody else is deserting Jesus, they say, Jesus turns to his disciples and they say, you know, are you going as well? And Peter, who often has the, the chronic problem of shoe and mouth syndrome, says, Lord, to whom else are we supposed to go? You have the words of eternal life. And that is where you should go as well. And to be faithful in that in your own Christian lives and built around the gospel and to remember that that, is, that same gospel which the world needs is what you need as well. Be centered around the word. Be centered around the gospel. Thirdly, we spent a lot of times on, on, the, on the, the solemnity and necessity of preaching. But what about the character of the preacher? What about the character of the preacher? Now, he s says in verse 5, or at least in the first half, and, and I would, I'll say this, character does matter. Character makes a huge difference for a minister. Um, 
He says, as for you, always be sober-minded and endure suffering. Be serious, is what he's saying. Be serious. Uh, you know, ministers, by the very nature of their office, it's a, gravi- it's, a, it's a sobering office with a lot of sobering realities. Sobering events. Um, and it needs to be treated seriously. You need a serious person and who can do and endure the suffering that often accompanies not just within his ministry, but within his own life as well. Paul talks a lot about the qualifications of a minister in Titus chapter, excuse me, first Timothy, second Timothy chapter three, first Timothy chapter three, verses one to seven, and then also in Titus one. Now a lot of those 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 qualities aren't particularly remarkable. None of those qualities are especially remarkable because each and every one of you should be, what? Sober-minded. You should be serious about your calling as Christians. And if you're married, you should be faithful to your spouse. You should be loving. You should be gentle. You should not be, you should be above reproach such that nobody else around you can have a negative thing to say about your consistent walk with the Lord. Your faith, the manner of your living, should be such that nobody else finds anything or is able to accuse you of wrongdoing. But it's uniquely centered around the minister. His character matters. What he does in private makes a huge difference. Uh, As well as your own. The fact is that the man of God's character should be of such a nature that whenever you are telling your grandsons, at least, grandchildren or children, who do you want to be like? I mean, most of us want to think about being the next greatest athlete. All of us know who LeBron James is. Probably some of us know better who Michael Jordan is, but uh, we, we at least we at least know who these who these people are. You know, back in the back in the 80s and 90s, before he ran for president as a Republican, people said, "Be like Donald Trump." Why? Because look at what he did. Look at all the money that he that he ran that he raised. Look at all the money that he earned. Be like him. When was the last time you said, "Look at the minister in the pulpit and say, son, if you could be like him, you would be a better, you would be a good man." His character matters. And especially when you look around in, in, a, in an era today where there are so many ministers who, for different reasons or whatever, have falls from grace, whatever it might be, and they're scandalous falls from grace. They're terrible. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many of my own colleagues it's been the same. It's been the same case, even in seminary. Character matters for the minister. He is to be serious and able to endure much, much suffering it's not just simply teaching the word anybody i mean anybody who can fake it can get can get behind a pulpit and be a good public speaker his holiness should be unmistakable work ethic matters too in verse five the second half of uh of verse five says this he's to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your fulfill his ministry now uh, the word evangelist has been used throughout the Bible to describe different things. I mean, like, you know, he preaches the gospel. We think of the guy who goes to, you know, the, I mean, I'm sure most of you remember the old camp meeting revivals or whatever where you have the, the, the traveling evangelist. He comes to the church. He preaches the revival service. He encourages people to come to, come to faith in Jesus and plays like 30,000 verses of just as I am. I don't know if that, there's that many, but there at least, I mean, he, that, that's just what we have in our minds. But an evangelist is someone who doesn't just preach the word, who doesn't treat it seriously, but he equips the people of God to live their faith out with, with the same degree of seriousness and patience and faith. He's equipping people to do just that. And he does so with the purpose of fulfilling his ministry, meaning that it does come to an end. Every ministry comes, I mean, I, I was, one day I was, I remember uh, being here and I was, uh, I don't remember what I was here for, but I saw Mary Jo and Larry in the back room, uh, in the conference room, 
doing something, I think cleaning, but I remember uh, seeing all, seeing with her, we were talking about the, you remember talking about all of the pictures of the ministers in there. Uh, there have been a many ministers in this church, and there may be many more, who knows. Uh, and in any church that's been around as long as this church from like the 1880s has, and even further back if you're like Antioch or Mount Calvary, have had, a, had, a, had their share of ministers. And every ministry ha- minister has a common thread. What? It ends. Um, and I know that um, there was, uh, it, it, it's not as typical today, but, uh, you know, there was a pastor in, in, in Asheville, in a Presbyterian church, where he was a pastor of that church for about 50 years, 40, 50 years, somewhere in there. You know of another minister where he was, where in his uh, 45 years, he was, after 45 years of ministry in uh, Union Church, Mississippi, he had pastored that church for some 45 years before he was elected moderator of the General Assembly of the PCUS. And do you, how many years after do you think he ministered? Another 21, 19 or 20. He pastored, he ultimately pastored in Mississippi for over 60 years. Unheard of today. I mean, it was, it was I mean, because back in those days, you, you, you fulfilled your ministry even when it got tough because it was a serious work and he endured it uh, knowing that the work was higher than his own, his own sense of safety. And he worked hard at it. Uh, you work hard at marriages, don't you? And they viewed it as a marriage in that way. You don't just leave the church, but it does have its end. Just as the pastor in Asheville uh, lived for lived and pastored for 40 some odd years, the pastor at Union Church there seemed like he would never leave because he was there for 60 years, but the people loved him, and he loved them because he had could have left. Uh, and Timothy is about to be left by Paul as well. Because Paul continues on in verse 6 to say, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He's anticipating not just the end of his ministry, but the end of his life as well. He's given everything that he has. And it's time for it to end. There are a few things, though, that we can grapple from this as well, I think. First of all, always seek sound teaching. Always find a minister who's going to, with his own character, his own manner of life, his own teaching, is always going to be about that. Uh, and I mean something very particular here. It's not to seek simply sound teaching outside of the church, but to be gar- but to do your job as well of seeking someone who will teach soundly from this word, from this pulpit. Minister is to guard and seek the truth, but so are the people of God. Whatever you receive, what you seek, and sound teaching from other ministers in the future is just that, seek this, sound teaching. But ultimately, you should do this. Remember to pray for your minister as well. This passage is most directly pointed at ministers. And I can't tell you how many installation and ordination ceremonies I've been to where this very passage is actually preached on. Uh, The need for good preachers and good preaching today is rather great. But when you look at the character of the minister, be sure you're praying for him. Because one of the things that he's supposed to endure is what? We look at it in verse 5. He's to endure suffering. He's to endure it on your account for the sake of Christ. Pray for him. He needs it too. Any minister, even while he's supposed to have this high calling and character, he is still at what? At the end of the day, he is still a human being. The biggest help that you can give any minister is praying for him and supporting him and helping him, taking taking the bull by the horns almost, and helping him do his work. It's a joint effort to see the glory of the kingdom, the kingdom grow. And it's yours and my high calling as well. Ultimately, we are to be about embracing that godly, enduringly godly character of someone who understands the import 
of preaching, but you need to understand that import as well and to seek someone who's going to preach it. And even as, you know, who, uh, however long it might be, I don't know when, and I'm sure many of us don't know when the next preacher might come. But when he does, help him to fulfill his ministry. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this word. And we thank you, Lord, that you give it to us to remember to not just to, to hear another passage on a word that we've heard many a time before, but to preach the word and to live it accordingly in our own lives as well. And I pray that as we sing, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name, that, we'll, we'll find, that the church will find someone who will indeed preach, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.